We could have gone for something far more radical, perhaps with uh, greater fuel consumption saving. But, but of course the problem with that is that uh, the cost would go up significantly, yeah, yeah. no one would buy it and the impact on the environment would be relatively low. I knew we'd done our research right, I knew there was a market for it and I was adamant that there was a potential for this car to make it. Two very different teams making two very different vehicles. Both trying to revolutionise road transport, but at a price that people would pay. So how do you engineer success? For engineers these days, being aware of your market is at least as important as being technologically clever. This is particularly true in transport. You might not think there's much similarity between a racing car driver and white van man, but in both cases, you have to understand your market if your designs are going to be successful. Will Baxter and Colin Williams are two lads obsessed with cars. They absolutely love the looks and performance of Ferraris and Lamborghinis. As students at Huddersfield University, they had the chance to put their passion into practice. For their final year project, they had to design a car. We were given a brief to um, come up with a new car, uh, a whole new car, um, and we took that as a complete blank piece of paper. We've got an ability as students to be able to just do what nobody else has ever done before, and that was the dream. This wasn't going to be any old car. This was going to be the car of their dreams. I mean, the starting point is an example is a sketch here. You can see that, which is um, basically it's just got one, two, three, four wheels and a couple of it's seats and the steering wheel. Basic box chassis drawn through box the middle chassis. to give you an idea of. So we printed up hundreds of these and we're just sketching over the top. Colin wanted to be able to manufacture it, so whatever we did, it had to be able to be made. Yeah. And I just wanted something which was, which was sexy. Sounds cheesy, but it was like a miniature Ferrari, something which just looked gorgeous and said, you know, buy me. Obviously, a student loan doesn't stretch to building Ferraris. They needed something a lot less pricey, and they settled on a kit car. These have a fiberglass body and use off-the-shelf mechanical bits, and they're a hell of a lot cheaper than conventional cars. Basically, what we had was the chassis that was sat on some wheels in the workshop, um, and then uh, what we were doing then was actually gluing um, styrofoam on top of it and just padding the whole car out. So it was just this big blue square. By the time we'd finished, everything just squared it right out. The students carved out the shell of their super dream machine and after much gluing, shaping, building and painting, the Tonic R was done. Will and Colin finished off their project, picked up their degree, had a celebration party and set off to make their fortunes. We got some people from the industry come to look at it, people from other universities, uh, got to speak to quite a lot of people. Unfortunately, there was a small problem. Their car had no engine, no suspension, no brakes, and worst of all, no furry dice. If the Tonic R was ever going to turn heads down the high street, it would actually need to move. The boys needed a lot more than a cool shell, and this could cost a bundle. This can't be the end, you know. We can't have just slogged our guts out for the last ten months, got it here, for it to just fizzle out into history as, as being one of those things that almost made it, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't want that for it. Without cash, the boys were stalled on the starting line. Will and Colin had found someone interested in their speed machine. Stuart Taylor Motorsport is a specialist company producing light racers like the Tonic. And after the lads had a drive in some of their cars, they knew they'd come to the right place. We went out in this stupidly quick car, which I was just swearing the whole time. We just went up the block, turned around and came back, and I just got out and went, I'm not, that's bloody dangerous. And, like, it was very scary. And then we found out that that was the kind of performance that Ian was intending that the Tonic would have. So, that really kind of sealed the deal for us. It proved that the performance element was not an issue. We could provide the performance to match the look of the car. 
by showing them what our basically our standard product could do with that type of mechanical package. I think it proved very quickly to them that you know if we could combine that with the Tonic's looks, then there's something really quite special there. Now all they had to do was cram Ferrari performance into this tiny body, and all for peanuts. An absolute doddle. The first thing to do was find an engine that was fast, light and cheap. Like an old bike engine, perhaps. The bike engines are producing nowadays stunning levels of power for packages that are weighing in at 70 kilos. For an engine, a gearbox and everything to run it. Uh, the lighter car engines are still coming in 70, 80 kilos more, so that's nearly double the weight. Normal cars are metal and heavy, and so they need a big engine to pull them along. The Tonic is made of fibreglass, which is very light, so a bike engine could do the job. And bike engines are cheap. People fall off bikes all day long, and that's unfortunately my benefit. Uh, where bikes are being broken, we are using and recycling those parts into new vehicles, and the lease of life that they give to some of these cars is quite incredible. Thank <laughs> you.